All right, guys, so today I'm really excited. We have David Lamb here with us today. And uh, Dave and I have gotten to know each other over the past three years, uh, three and a half years now, actually. Um, Dave is a professor at Biblical Theological Seminary, where I graduated from recently. And, you know, to be honest with you, I just have really grown to appreciate Dave and his insight into the Word and um, just kind of a different perspective on, um, you know, bringing, bringing God's truth to life. And um, so, Dave, thanks for being with us here today. It's my pleasure, and it's been great to have you in class and to continue to interact with you in varieties of contexts. I've really enjoyed our interactions, Peter. Yeah, thanks, man. So um, Dave is also an author. Uh, he's written several books, and uh, a lot of a lot of your work, Dave, has been you know scholarly work. So it's very um, very heady. A lot of it, I think. Um, you know, one of your books is priced up around a hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, a bargain. Yeah, a, a real steal, um, you know. <laughs> um, yes. But no, he's he's written some great stuff. But one of the books that Dave wrote is more on the uh, the lower shelf for guys like me and uh, and people like yourself as well. And uh, that book is called God Behaving Badly, and uh, it's a really cool book. I picked that up as soon as it was uh, printed and and read through that myself. And um, so you know, I wanted to ask Dave a few questions today around that book, God Behaving Badly. And uh, so, Dave, why did you write that book? Like, help us understand, what was the uh, motivation behind writing something like that? I was on a date with my wife recently, and we ended up chatting with the server for a while, and he, I, he asked me what I do, and I said, well, I teach the Bible. And he said to me, um, well, you know, what part? I said, I teach the Old Testament. He says, the Old Testament, isn't that where God is always getting angry and smiting people all the time? <laughs> And I said, well, not exactly, but the God of the Old Testament has a bad reputation. I wrote this book for people like that server. Um, there's a, a, one of the most famous far side cartoons is God at his computer. Um, and God is sitting um, at his computer on the image of his, um, his display is an innocent looking guy walking down the street. He's going underneath an enormous grand piano supported by a few thin ropes. You pull back and you see God at his keyboard. He's got his finger hovering over one key in particular, the smite key. Ah, very well, nice. <laughs> wish we had a smite key. But this is the perception of the Old Testament God, that he's a smiter. Anything we do, anytime we do something wrong, he's going to give us the zap. And I think it's more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would tend to agree. Uh, but I would also agree with you that there's a lot of people out there who are asking the same question, who are saying, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, the other day I ran into a post on Facebook, a friend of mine, uh, she wrote this, it says, um, I just saw Jesus. Jim Caviezel is filming person of interest on my block. Two people liked it. And then a person responded to it and said, watch out, he's deadly. To which she responded and said, Sean, I think you're thinking of God. He's the wrathful, vengeful guy. Jesus just loves everybody. Although, they're supposed to be the same or something. That's why I avoid church. It's just all too confusing. You know, so Dave, like, I think that there is a, a common uh, misconception out there that, that God has to be one or the other, that he has to be either loving or angry. Um, you know, so, so what do you think? Like, how would you respond um, to that question? Is God loving or is he angry? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think whenever I hear people talking about uh, a confusing God, I want to agree with them. I want to say, yes, it is complicated. It is confusing. Hmm. Um, one of the things, the, the statement I start the book off with is, how do we explain the loving God of the Old Testament or how do we reconcile the loving God of the Old Testament with the harsh God of the New Testament? People give me kind of a confused look whenever I ask them that. But the reality is, God in the Old Testament is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But Jesus speaks about hell more than anyone in the Bible. Huh. The God of both Old and New, I think, is loving and concerned about justice. So... He tells the people, his people in the Old Testament, that they need to care for the widow and the orphan um, and the poor. And if he doesn't, he's going to get mad. And in some cases, he's going to smite them for not being concerned about justice enough. So there we get sort of a sense of his anger, his judgment, but his concern for the oppressed all at the same time. I don't fully understand it, but um, in the same way that we see Jesus 
concerned about the poor and the oppressed. We see God in the Old Testament in the same manner. And I think it may be confusing, but there's um, they can be reconciled. But it, it does take some work. Huh. So what's one of the examples uh, from the Old Testament where you feel like really displays God's, God's love really well? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, there's um, repeatedly we see um, God showing mercy to people mm. that don't seem to deserve it. Um, I think uh, God showed um, mercy to Abraham. Yeah. Um, Abraham yeah. lied about his wife, Sarah, um, and um, ended up sleeping with his maid, Hagar, and yet God was still willing to work through Abraham. And in fact, when Abraham was advocating um, for the city of Sodom, now some, a lot of us know the story of Sodom, and um, Sodom had a bad end, but Abraham was interacting with God to show mercy to even to Sodom, and God listened to him and was gracious there. Um, you know, the fact that God, the biggest event in the Old Testament is where God delivered his people from Egyptian enslavement. Huh. That tells me something that God is concerned for justice, and he wants to take people out of slavery, and he does that for his people, and then later he commands his people to be to be gracious pe to people and to be gracious to their neighbors as well. Um, there's a lot more that could be said, but I do think it's amazing how we see God caring for his people when they're oppressed, and we see that pattern throughout the Bible, that when widows, orphans, or other people like that that are needy are crying out to God for help, he's quick to listen to their cries. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, that's, you know, sitting in class with you, Dave, I've, I've heard you talk about those stories a whole bunch, and, and I know that you expound on some of them in your book, so you know, I'd love for people to dig in more there. Um, you know, because uh, I got another question, a follow-up one, and that is, like, so if I'm looking at the Old Testament and the New Testament, and, you know, I'm just kind of reading through that, it's easy for me to say, well, the Old Testament God, you know, he seems to be the one that makes all the rules. Yeah. And then, like, Jesus in the New Testament, he seems to be the one that breaks all the rules. And he's <laughs> like, well, you've heard it said, but I say... And yeah. um, so the question I would say is, is God legalistic or is he gracious? Because in the yeah, Old Testament, we've got, you know, we've got the Ten Commandments. And then the New Testament, we've got 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. Seems like God's, he's like, hey, you know what? I got you. I'm covering for you where, uh, where you're falling short. Yeah, I, I think that's I think there's a lot of validity to that question. I think a lot of people have that question. I think it's good to um, work to understand that. Um, the thing I keep saying is the God of the old and the God of the new are the same, although that doesn't, it's not always obvious to us. I mean, the first thing I like to point out is the very first command in the Bible is uh, Genesis 1, where God says, be fruitful and multiply. Well, when I talk to my students about this, I say, okay, so in order to be mul to be multiplying and being fruitful, what's gonna what's got to go on? Well, they mm -hmm. usually tell me, um, you know, I'm I'm still slow on this, but they <laughs> enlighten me and they say, hey, Dave, sex is gonna happen. Well, in order to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, how much sex are we talking about? And they're saying, well, Dave, that sounds like a lot of sex. So I say, you're telling me <laughs> the very first command in the Bible is a command to have a lot of sex. Well, that doesn't seem like too bad of a command. Now, obviously, in the context of Scripture, this is in a lifelong, lifelong committed um, relationship between a man and a woman. But that doesn't seem like a particularly mean God so far. The second command, if you jump to Genesis 2, is um, God tells the humans they can eat freely of every tree in the garden. So my paraphrase, uh, eat a lot of food. I like um, that. So That's a good idea. Yeah, amen. Preach it, brother. No, that's that that speaks to my heart. And I think obviously another one of the big commands is rest. rest. Yeah, right. Now we can be legalistic about that. We can take any one of God's laws and make it into some kind of a legalistic thing that God is trying to do to, to deprive me of fun. Um there's a, a, a Simpsons episode where um Maggie um disappears and oh what's the older sister's name? 
Babe, Maggie's the baby. Lisa. Um, Lisa has to come rescue her from a group of nuns. And in the, in the background, the nuns are singing, If you're happy and you know it, it's a sin. <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, it's a sin. Now, um, you know, obviously, the perception is that whenever we're doing something fun, God doesn't want us to be doing that. So that's therefore a sin. But I think in reality, when God gives us commands to be fruitful, to eat a lot of food, to rest, those are obviously all things that we desperately need. Sometimes the commands don't make sense to us, but in their context, I think they do make a lot more sense. But it takes a little work. Yeah. Yeah, that's great, Dave. I, I actually uh, I love that idea. That imagery there that you help us with is, is incredible. So, Dave, last question. How would you respond to my friend when she ends this conversation by saying, you know, I think that uh, they're all supposed to be the same, you know, all... Jesus and God, they're supposed to be the same thing or something, but you know that's why I avoid church. It's just all too confusing. So what would you say to her? Yeah, I would, I mean, personally, I mean, again, I'm an Old Testament guy, but I would challenge her to say, well, just start with Jesus. Read about Jesus. What was Jesus like? Who did Jesus care for? Um, and as you get to know Jesus better, I think most people, just people that aren't familiar with Jesus or the Gospels, they fall in love with this guy who mm -hmm. loves the outcasts, yeah. hangs out with the um, sinners and the tax collectors, tells these amazing stories that we are still retelling today, and asks just amazing questions. And once people get to know Jesus better, they're going to realize that Jesus' Bible was the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And um, Jesus quoted the Old Testament frequently because he loved it. And um, I see a continuity between the God on the pages of the Old Testament and the God as he's portrayed in the pages of the New Testament. So, I mean, I, to, to, to your friend, your, your, your friend Pete, I would say, I know why you say that, and I know a lot of people feel that way too, and I just want to say, I, if, if someone says that to me, I thank them for being honest. But um, I'd say, hey, can we talk about this some more? And I'd say, let's look at the te some text together. I, I usually would start people with Jesus and then try to bring them back to the Old Testament. And I think that after hopefully some an extended period of time, people, people would realize the God of both Testaments is loving, compassionate, and gracious. Hmm. Yeah, that's great, Dave. Thanks, man. <clears throat> Last clarifying point. Is Jim Caviezel really Jesus? <laughs> yes, clearly. <laughs> yes. Uh, none better. <laughs> none none better. You're right. Although I, I do like the Jesus that they had in um, the History Channel's The Bible. Uh, uh, there were some great stories there. I, I don't even know who the actor is, but um, yeah. Um, awesome. Sure. <clears throat> hey, Dave, thanks for being with us today. I uh, really appreciate your insights. And, you know, I, I think that one of the things that you said at the, in the last little bit there was, you know, sometimes sometimes reading the Bible can be uh, a little bit confusing. And, sure. um, you know, to our, to our modern day mindset and to the readers, who we are and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, one of the things I think that Dave does is in his book, um, God Behaving Badly, is he provides a gift to us by illustrating and helping us see how you know the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are so clearly um, one in the same and, and their heart beats after the same thing so personally I highly recommend that you check that book out and uh, you know get into a, a group discussion about it or something like that I'd love to take you out to coffee and uh, chat with you about it um, and you know maybe we can follow up with Dave at another time if we have some questions so yeah. Dave thanks for being here today man and uh, you know, hope you're doing well thanks my pleasure